So thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you this evening uh, or this afternoon. Um, and as Mary said, I'm going to try and give you a few thoughts on what I think bog figures might be. Um, but I'm going to do it through a particular case study that's dear to my own heart from Holderness in East Yorkshire and then pull back a bit to use them to tell a story both of why these figures, these anthropomorphic figures capture our imagination and they capture our attention and I think they were always meant to do that um, but through their story I want to show you how we've had very different ideas of what they should do for us in particularly in a museum context and how the new discoveries might force us to rethink that a little bit. Um, so these are the Ruse Car figures and anyone who visited the wonderful exhibition at the World Stonehenge at the uh, British Museum recently would have seen them towards the end of this narrative around British, Irish and near continental prehistory, where they are paired with an image from Scandinavian rock art. And you'll see perhaps in the little label there described in a category that might be meant to evoke spiritual warriors. And we can see why people might think that with these figures. We, we have a series of little um uh figures made either of pine or of you um they're kind of large action man's size but they're of a very different scale to many of the figures that we've heard about today um they were found in a peaty boggy environment but it's the at the edge of a creek so a rather different landscape context but they are found with an object that mimics a boat um, but has an animal head they're found with objects that are palpably meant to represent shields, but also other accoutrements, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so it gives us an image of not just one figure, but a group of figures acting together um, uh, that stimulate the imagination in a way that calls to mind these extraordinary petroglyphs of um, Scandinavia with their armed, shielded warrior figures um, riding in boats um, about to undertake who knows what, um, but I'm going to offer a few thoughts on them. But I, I want to um, unfold the story of their discovery and their, particularly their illustration. I think this is a key part of the story of bog figures and how they have changed in appearance over time as a way of showing back to us, I think, some of our attitudes towards the human body and the role of such figures um, uh, in past and present. So the very earliest account of them we have um, uh, tells us that in 1836, as some labourers were redigging out the drainage ditches on that extraordinary wetland environment of Holderness, um, they came across this set of, uh, of objects, uh, apparently in a box um, in this blue clay, um, rudely carved and put together. And some of them were too decayed to rescue them or remove them. But out of what survives, it tells us we have these, these humanoid figures, these shields and the little boat at the bottom, somewhat resembling a canoe. Um, and it also tells us that some of them had little quartzite eyes. So with these, these figures, along with um, uh, the Balahulish go goddess, for example, we can be very certain that they have a kind of an animacy to the face, which is very humanoid. Um, and this is the earliest um, illustration we have of the figures. Um, one of them, unfortunately, with, you know, every accoutrement possible, literally tacked back onto the onto the figure with little iron nails and glue and um, all sorts of other materials. Um, and it's little legs, which are, uh, we assume, still a little bit flexible at the time, jammed into one of the one of the slots on the boat. And the early antiquarians were convinced that this was a boat originally meant to take eight figures because there were too many figures to have a leg hole each. And we now think that one of the sets of figures was meant to fit in the boat but one of them wasn't, and that, that tells it a rather different story. Um, and this is the landscape context in which they um, come from. This is Ruse Carr. The earliest Ordnance Survey map here, 1855, shows no mention of them, but there was clearly somebody who was very interested in archaeology by the 1910 survey, and he went around noting the discovery of famous archaeological finds. So here we have the fine spot of the carved ancient remain, or remains of an ancient boat found in AD 1836. So we can be very sure of that landscape context. Um, we know that initially the local farmer kept them, Mr. Bilton, um, and people who saw them thought that they were meant to represent that most um, kind of violent of, of incomers to East Yorkshire, uh, the Vikings, um, pour, or the Saxons, whatever, pouring in from Scandinavia, apparently. 
Um, and at some point, the farmer uh, hands them over to the Museum of the Literary and Philosophical Society, where they're seen by other individuals. The Reverend Dodds is very convinced that these are meant to represent either Noah and his family, um, or perhaps a kind of more symbolic representation of the planets. And that was a, an interpretation that was thought to be a little bit far out there by others. Um, one of the earliest discussions with Danish archaeologists, um, Feddersen, puts out there this idea that they are much more ancient. And of course, he was he was absolutely right. Um, but Smith writing in 1884 notes that only four of those figures remain. And this is a very early photograph from the museum. They end up in the Museum of Hull um, of those four figures. And you'll note just the one shield there. Um, and then people get very imaginative with them. This is a very early piece of, of uh, photographic manipulation where somebody um, it makes multiple copies of images of these figures and, and, and puts them together as they were originally meant to seem, um, rapidly kind of expanding the length of the boat to fit all the figures. Um, and of course, this was never how the assemblage existed in the past, but it's become a very kind of uh, dominant image of them. Um, and over time, uh, they're put together in slightly different ways. Um, and different curators of that museum kind of take bits off, put them back on in different combinations. But one bit of them, several bits of them, are consistently missing from these early images. And that is the removable phalli um, that are nowhere to be seen in any of those early images. And I'm reliably informed they were kept in a small box behind the scenes. <laughs> um, being inappropriate for view. And of course, the whole point about these is that they can swivel. They can be up or they can be down. They, But these figures, as we've already heard, in their current form, have a gender ambiguity to them. They can be male and they can be female. And this, again, is something, you know, that other elements of this crew that can be taken on and taken off. And that mutability, I think, is also something very important. Um, so we actually have one of the Fallow visit uh, visible in the 1903 image, and that's because it's been stuffed into an arm socket as an additional arm to hold on the top shield. Um, but uh, but and, and quite what that lower shield is perched on, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> anyway, then something surprising happens. Somebody turns up at the museum with another one. And it turns out that this is um, a son who's come across this figure. It belonged to his mother, who was a daughter of the surveyor who worked on the project uh, around the, these drains. And he had kept one of these ancient dollies. Um, he'd actually made a spare arm for it out of oak, and his daughter had then lovingly cherished this object. Um, she describes it as an ancient dolly, and I can't help but feel um, that she probably treated it as such, and it may even have had its own set of clothes, I don't know. Um, but it's not that dissimilar from the kind of wooden dolls that you would find in the Victorian period. Um, either way, this is something that connects her very strongly to her father. She curates it. She looks after it. So it's only in uh, 1903 that it enters the whole museum and joins its fellows, um, bringing with it that extra little shield, round shield. Um, and this means that they have to rethink the number of figures and the size of the boat. Um, and it means that there are possibly two crews being represented in this assemblage. So within the whole museum, there, there are a very helpful set of conservation notes made by curator Andy Foxen in the early 1990s that tells us of all of the materials that we've been sticking onto them or people have used to hold them together. One of them has unfortunately had its legs sawn off um, and uh, repairs made. Um, you can see there wax used, glue, um, droplets of adhesive. And this is part of the materiality now of that assemblage. The boat itself was even held together with string. And over time, curators have, of course, removed some of those materials as they've tried to return them to their original um, uh, appearance. Um, so it was in this kind of manner that they were displayed um, from the 1960s onwards, looking, I have to say, rather like my son and his teenage friends cramming themselves into a photo booth for a, a teenage photograph, but quite, you know, awkwardly clumped together and again, minus their, their bits. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, they go on to become very important poster boys, if you like, for the Iron Age. Um, fortunately, they survived the bombing of Hull Museum uh, and its temporary transfer. And McGaw and Simpson use one of the figures on the front of their book um, on British prehistory. 
Barry Cunliffe uses them on Iron Age communities in Britain. Um, but we start to see in the work of people like Paul Ashby a rather different interpretation of what these might be, not just kind of cute little representatives of, of ancient people, but rather sinister cult figures. And there's something really quite unnerving about those little quartzite eyes peering out at you from the cabinet. And I think that's a that's a an atmosphere that the um, World Stonehenge exhibition captured quite well. So it was only really with Bryony Cole's wonderful article dating to the early 1990s that we get a full account of these figures from a kind of uh, a well-renowned wood specialist. Um, and she notes the different elements that survive up to the present. She talks about the animal head of the boat, the different attributes of the suites of figures. She thinks that there are two different um, sets of people being represented here physically in terms of the length of their trunks and apparently the the kind of the impressiveness of their calf musculature, which is very interesting, um, and the kind of overall face um, and head uh, shape. So it is possible we're looking at rival groups being represented in these figures. Um, she notes that the eyes are a mixture of quartz and limestone, um, and she describes one of the arms as being quite paddle-like with this interesting hole at the end, and talks about this separatable kind of assemblage of components, which must be about changing parts, must be about mutability, must be about changing even gender perhaps. And um, But one of the things that she notes in that article is that she thinks that they're made of pine. Now in a later article, she says that they are you. I am not a wood specialist, but they look more you like to me. Um, but that's something that I would really like to resolve because I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to call Bryony Coles on her. Wood species identification, I think it's, you know, it's something that we would need to reinvestigate. Um, whatever they're made of, um, it was Bryony who got them radiocarbon dated. I've just put those radiocarbon dates through the latest ver uh, version of OxCal. And actually that really expands the date range of these really between that late Bronze Age and um, early Iron Age period. Um, and that would fit the shields. They look much more like late Bronze Age shields than they do Middle Iron Age shields. Um, and I've just put for, just uh, as, a, as a loving nod to Ida Kloon, the slow club there, you know, which is very reminiscent, I think, of the kind of arm stroke paddle stroke club that I think that little uh, appendage is meant to be. And courtesy of Peter Halken, we can be fairly sure that they are deposited at a very interesting time and in a very interesting place in this landscape. So during the early Iron Age, we see a massive marine transgression flooding large areas of Holderness. And so we know that our coastline is way out here. This is fast eroding um, back in towards East Yorkshire itself, but it would have been further out. But Holderness, which is now nicely drained by those wonderful um, uh, engineers, um, would have been a mass of kind of waterways, creeks and inlets. And the ruse car figures come from around about down here, right on the brink of one of these tortuous little inlets, which must have been navigated by boat um, and would be seasonally very productive wetlands. But obviously this is uh, an environment you need to navigate by particular means. Now, the little Square dots on that map are the Arras cemeteries, the square barrow cemeteries of the middle to late Iron Age. So they are situated in a landscape that is soon to become one of the great hotspots of Iron Age activity. But the people who made these figures are living in quite a difficult time. We've got a downturn in the climate, so um, crops um, uh, lose some of their growing season. We know environmentally there's greater rainfall. So this is quite a difficult time to be alive. And actually our footprint of that late Bronze Age, early Iron Age period, and um, certainly in the early Iron Age in particular, is quite slight in this landscape, probably because a lot of the areas we've been doing our rescue and development work in were so watery and, and therefore not inhabitable. Um, so we do have some rare late Bronze Age hill forts and some rare early Iron Age settlement, but it's not then they're, they're not made within the great moment of kind of Iron Age life within that landscape. It's something different. So what are they? Whether these figures are made of pine or whether they're made of yew, they speak to us of um, a medium that is being chosen to represent the human body. And there was a question earlier about are they similar to the stone statues of this period? And, and my answer would be no, because we don't have any. 
They are not making human figures out of stone during that early Iron Age period. And most of our stone figures of the Iron Age come from, um, you know, they come from Gaul, they come from Germany, and they come from Switzerland, Austria. We don't have a strong tradition of thinking that stone is the right medium to represent the human form. In fact, we don't think it's, you know, even in the Middle Iron Age, in our big period of Latin art, the human figure comes and goes within our Latin art. It is not accurately represented very often as the human form. So it's telling us something important about, I think, I, I'll put it out this, about some kind of synergy between wood and between the human form that is important to early Iron Age people. I think we've heard about a lovely variety of woods selected by different people to make their figures. Um, but if we are dealing with you um, in terms of the substance that these figures are made out of, um, we're dealing with a with a wood that's naturally toxic that can kill you. You know, the berries from it, um, the needles are toxic, the wood itself is toxic. Um, so this is a wood that has danger written within its grain, if you like. And I think that that's why I think they're probably you and that they are deliberately selected from this potent matter to make something that is meant to be literally kind of emanating um, martial prowess and danger. Um, the uh, other materials involved in their making, the quartzite um, uh, and limestone, it has a wetness and a whiteness to it and um, uh, a kind of a luminescence that I think is, again, deliberately meant to animate these figures, to give them life. So I think these are really potent little creatures. And as Bryony herself noted, that gender ambiguity is really interesting in a period when, as John Robb and Oliver Harris have argued, um, gender, uh, gendered ideas about the body and what it is to be a man or a woman or, or, or genders in between are snapping into much sharper focus. And this is a period in which, you know, certainly a couple of hundred years later in the Arras communities, as far as we can tell from the burials, kind of maleness and femaleness are quite strongly prescribed. So those figures that can cross those boundaries that are more fluid might be seen as doubly potent. And maybe that is some of the power of the ambiguity of, of gender in such figures, too. Um, so here they are in all their glory, I think, properly emanating that kind of potency and power um, uh, within their kind of boat figure. And the role of that boat, that canoe, um, in those societies um, has been magnified by some recent discoveries from the great um, uh, wetland site in the southeast of Britain uh, called Must Farm, where we found lots of uh, late Bronze Age uh, dugout vessels covered in decorations. Some have little eyes on them. So the notion that the boat itself has some animacy, I think, is something that was probably current in late Bronze Age, early Iron Age thought. And whether we think the prow of that boat is meant to be an otter or uh, a beaver or something much more massive, the kinds of whales or cetaceans washed up on the shore of Holderness, I'm fairly sure that, again, they are mixing domains of the human and um, the material world to create something that is meant to capture the power of a creature that can move between land and water and has kind of, you know, excellent hunting skills, perhaps even woodworking skills, um, or is intimidating in some way. So let's step back for a moment, because these Ruskar figures are very different to many of the other ones we've heard about today. Roddenberg, um, King Staten, Rulagan, the wonderful boxwood figure from Strata, Florida, Dagenham and Brack. Those are more massive, they're singular, and they are found, as we've heard, in a classic kind of bog environment. And Ben has talked to us already about this wonderful uh, figure, the Balahulish um, goddess, um, dubbed Our Lady of the Ferry um, when she was found by the peat diggers. Um, and in fact, um, Christensen's report, um, in a way, just paraphrases the earlier uh, account for the Inverness Courier by Stuart. And you'll note that what he says, just almost in passing right at the end of his article, is, oh, of course, it comes from a bog that also yielded ox and deer horns of a large size, casks of bog butter, wooden basins, platters and bowls. Of these we have no trace. Likewise, the bun of hair, the top knot that was once adorning her head, 
presumably fell off on the way to Edinburgh. No sign of it remains, and it certainly wasn't recorded in the later images. Um, but that notion that this is a guardian figure, our Lady of the Ferry, Ben showed you that wonderful landscape setting of that peat bog, right in the heart of the glens at a very narrow crossing point over the lock, I think is something that we need to return to. Because when we look at the landscape context of some of our continental neighbours, for example, we find out that depictions of human forms are rare. This is actually a very miniature um, object. Uh, much debate has been made over this. This is from a late Bronze Age midden site down in East Chisholmbury. Um, so it's rare that people kind of almost dare to represent the human form. Um, but the bog figures are often found in very important places. They're at narrow points in the landscape or dangerous crossings, as with the Oldenburg figures. And as has been mentioned a number of times already, they are often in very good nick. They might be coarsely, rapidly, expediently made, but they have a brief life. They have a heyday and then they go into the bog quite quickly. Now, that may be because, as many of our archaeological projects have proved, those trackways don't last long. Bogs grow. They are animate. They swallow back up the things that we've put in them to make a firmer footing. So the life of a bog figure, I think, is a brief one. Um, and I think they are toppled deliberately, laid down, placed down, sometimes, as we've heard um, with Corlay, built into the very foundations of the track itself. And I think that notion that they are in some way meant to flank, to guard, to greet, um, tells us something important about their role in the bog. So if I had to, I mean, I don't, I don't know what they meant. I must, you know, there are many different interpretations, but I think they are fulfilling the purpose of creating an almost human, but slightly supernatural permanent presence at dangerous places where you go to do daring things where it's a kind of a, a precarious endeavor if you like you know slaughtering those animals by the bog side taking things offering them up but you've got to go to those special places to do it we've heard of this relationship between Rathcoggan and Gorna Cranach and I think that notion of undertaking a short but potentially um, dangerous journey and doing these things in the bog might mean that these figures form a role there in terms of greeting you marking places, warning you, assailing you perhaps, um, and uh, some of them are meant to perhaps intimidate you, um, some of them are meant to be guardian figures, protective, apotropaic figures in those places. And the reason why I'm increasingly thinking that that, that micro locale, as Ben said, this is really important that we pay attention to that exact place in the bog, is because they don't just occur in bogs. This is one, and I'm totally grateful to Rob Sands at UCD for drawing my attention to this article. Here's one, nicely Iron Age, very like many of our other figures, guarding a glacial pass in Switzerland. And by its side and close vicinity are a series of long, slender sticks, stakes that have been interpreted by the authors either as walking sticks. This is a, an environment like the bog where a good grip staff like the Ida Clune honeysuckle staffs might be really valuable. Um, they could be way markers. And what is down at the bottom of the modern glacial pass, but a cross. So that notion that you are being warned that you are in a dangerous place and you need help to cross safely here, but you are in the presence of supernatural beings, and yet they are almost human enough to be appealed to. I think this is telling us something really important about the Iron Age supernatural world. So the things that people are giving back to those bogs, um, as uh, Eve said this, mo uh, this morning, I think in the Iron Age become quite different to the kinds of offerings you give in different prehistoric periods. Um, and in the Iron Age, they are drawn from that mundane world of Iron Age life. And it's easy to write them off as broken, damaged bits. But why do you have bits of wagons or carts or chariots that could never cross such a place? Why do you take them to the bog to get rid of them? Or a broken yoke or plaits of hair in Denmark or this extraordinary wax cake from Ipwegamore? 
um, which uh, um, uh, again one of the scholars in Germany has imaginatively um, interpreted as um, uh, a wax block for easing the uh, friction on a chariot wheel. Um, the wonderful Orkney hood, textiles, shields like Canora, um, bog butter. You are giving in the Iron Age from every domain of life, but you're giving often of your best. A cream, the cream of life, the churn of butter made out of, you know, many pats put together probably from the community. A beautifully made but often quite old garment, redolent with life, with the hands it's passed to, stitched and repaired, um, or weaponry that's damaged, bits of vehicles that had, you know, the grit worn into the tyre, I think, um, as uh, as we heard from um, Ida Kloon um, in the uh, lecture just a couple of days ago. These are not meaningless rubbish. These are redolent with the vitality of the agricultural everyday world from which you have come. And I think that gives them a, a greater potency. And the fact that they are often damaged and broken um, tells us again something important about how objects ended their life. We, we've thought about where we might put them or where we must put them. Perhaps there were right places for those things to end their lives in. And when the Romans encountered this kind of behaviour amongst the barbarian tribes, they were really puzzled by it. Here's the account of um, uh, Erosius's account of the Cimbri's victory and aftermath um, against the Romans. And they're saying they are absolutely crazy because they just wreck everything. They completely destroyed clothing, cut to pieces, strewn about, gold and silver thrown in the river, um, hack, hacking of breastplates to pieces. They drown the horses, they hang the men, and as it puts it, the conqueror realised no booty while the conquered obtained no mercy. And that was an alien logic to Roman forces who intended to take this stuff home and hang it over their doorway um, or parade it in uh, one of their great triumphs. And here we see Plutarch's description of one of those triumphs where they're heaping up all this booty on their wagons, their chariots, parading them and their prisoners through the streets. Um, but interestingly, the way in which they array them on those wagons is really important. So there's another classic Roman text which warns people, when you've got your stolen booty, do not put the weaponry together in sets. Don't do that because it could come back to life. Right. So the Romans themselves know, even if there are no northern barbarians behind these things, there is an animacy in these objects that could you know, come back to ha literally haunt them. So they are frightened of these things too. So objects at the end of their lives are potent and vibrant and dangerous, and they have to be treated with respect and they have to find the right place to have their lives ended. Now, if you live in Wessex in a hill fort, it's the bottom of a subterranean storage pit where you've been storing your grain. But if you live in and around a bog, a place where again, things, where time stops, where things are kept, under the power and in the domain of the supernatural underworld, then the bog is the right place, I think, to take these things and to build into the new works that you daringly place across the bog. So this is why, as, as Eve's picked up on, I like to call these everyday treasures. And I think we need to rethink the value that we give to these objects, that they are well-made things that sometimes are at the end of their lives, sometimes I think it was Ben who suggested some of those figures are made as part of the job itself, rather like, you know, in, in the air I grew up in in Dorset, a thatcher would end end off his thatching endeavour with a little animal on the top of the thatch. Now, at one level, that's kind of charming and curious and a bit of a craftsman's mark. At the other, it was always meant to be a bit of a protective figure for that thatch so it wouldn't catch fire. So that realm of the kind of amusing, charming, protective, I think, again, is something we need to hang on to when we're thinking about the power of these figures. But the fact that we are depicting sacred supernatural figures, uh, figures in the form of the human, I think that is curious too. It tells of us of a time when dealing with the gods is dealing with people-like things, um, and you rarely represent it in your art, which is why I think the bog figures are so important to our understanding of Iron Age life. Now, Aidan and, and other people in the audience have spent a long time making these, crafting them, and that observation that um, 
many of them do not seem to have decayed. Um, they go into the bog quite quickly and that sets them apart with things like North American totem poles or Melanesian funerary sculptures, which are meant to decay as part of their life cycle. Again, I think we can use our anthropology here to tell us something important about their um, their brief life, but their perpetual fate in the bog. And I'm very convinced that they are mindful and aware of that peculiar power of um, sphagnum moss. So I want to end with an image. Um, this is uh, an image made by wonderful Eric Carlson. Um, and I asked him to imagine for me the scene in, in the moment of the use of the ruse car figures. And I've snuck in there an, an Ida Klune star uh, and a decapitated head. Um, this is based on a head um, uh, I've been working on called George, interestingly, but um, that's another that's another lecture, another story. Um, but I but I've imagined these as figures that you animate, that you get out of the box and you pose and you almost reenact whether this is sympathetic magic before a hunting raid, whether this is the aftermath of something that's gone wrong and surrogate figures are being made for warriors who've been lost. These are meant to be brought out, handled, passed around and then kept. But I also asked him to imagine the moment when they were found, when they come back to us out of these PT shores. So here they are being rediscovered by the drainage diggers. And here on the edge there, that I've imagined is our surveyor who takes home the ancient dolly to start its new life in the hands of his daughter. So I hope I've offered you a few thoughts about why I think these are so important to mm. late prehistoric archaeologists and why they often go through a chequered history um, and the way in which we represent them and, and display them changes over time. Um, and in that way, they tell us as much about ourselves as they do about the past. Thank you.